Hello, Professor Simmons here. We're going to do an example showing how Jacobians are used in changing an integral from one coordinate system to hopefully a more convenient coordinate system. We're going to look at this integral shown here. And just looking at the integrand, we see it might be more convenient to do if we change two coordinates where x minus y and x plus y were in fact our variables like this u and v here. So in other words, the first step in changing to a better coordinate system is picking a coordinate system where our integrand looks nicer, so we've done that. The second thing we'll have to do is pick limits for our new integrals in the new variables. So we'll be integrating the new variables, uh, we'll be integrating the integrand with respect to those variables, and there will be a Jacobian factor. Now, I'm going to choose to do the v integral second and the u integral first. So let's think about the limits for the v integral. Since it's being done second, we anticipate that its limits will both be constant. And if we think about it, uh, v is simply the sum of x and y. So the smallest value of v should, will just be the sum of the smallest values of x and y, but those are both zero. So the minimum of v should be zero. v maximum should be adding up the largest values of x and y, which is one. So yes, those limits are constant as we anticipated. We anticipate that in contrast, the limits for the u variable might be functions of v that would not be unusual for the inner integral. If we think about how to figure out the smallest value of u, let's look at the definition of u. Since u is x minus y, if x is as small as possible, then subtracting y from it will take us down to the lowest possible value of u. So we anticipate that u will take on its minimum value when x equals 0. But when x equals 0, v and y are just the same thing. So the minimum value of u is just negative v. Similarly, the maximum value of u should occur when we are subtracting as little as possible from x. So u maximum should occur for y equals 0. But that would make u equal to x. But when y equals 0, u is just, negative, is just equal to v. That is, when y equals for y equals 0, we see that u and v are each equal to x and therefore equal to each other. So we conclude that the integral we're trying to do has limits, uh, goes from having limits 0 to 1 for y and 0 to 1 minus y for x to having limits 0 to 1 for v, but negative v to v for u. And don't forget the Jacobian factor. Of course, we will be putting in the integrand in both places as well. But just thinking about the limits for the moment, it's often useful to draw a diagram to confirm. And here, this is a, this is a great idea, here is our original integral where we are um, taking constant values of y and marching along in the x direction to the largest possible value, and we're carving out this triangular region as directed by the limits. And we see that in the new coordinate system, we're taking constant values of v and marching along in the u direction in successive strips. And we see that, in fact, our old integration area and our new integration area are simply related by a 45 degree angle rotation. So everything is, in fact, consistent. In the next slide, we'll go on to talk about the Jacobian factor that we expect here in translating to our new coordinates u equals x minus y and v equals x plus y. So let's find the Jacobian we need. Remember, we're going from an integral in dx and dy to an integral in du and dv. So the Jacobian factor is then the magnitude of uh, this uh, partial x comma y with respect to partial u comma v. So we'll calculate this two ways. One way to calculate it is to say, you know, originally what we actually have written down on the page is u as a function of x and y, 
and v is a function of x and y, and that actually makes it easier to find this Jacobian factor because we can see that the partial derivative of u with respect to x is just 1, and partial u with respect to y is just negative 1 because u is x minus y, and similarly for the v partial derivatives. And then taking the magnitude of the determinant of this matrix, the answer is 2. But the Jacobian factor we need is literally the inverse of the one we so easily calculated, so that's a half. So a half is the Jacobian factor we need. Now we could have also directly calculated this one by saying, well, let's switch around our variables so that we have x as a function of u and v and y as a function of u and v. And if we add u and v, we find that x can be defined in this way, and if we subtract them, we find y can be, uh, in fact, defined in this way. Now that we have x and y as functions of u and v, we can calculate the Jacobian factor that we really need directly by taking a partial derivative of x with respect to u and seeing that's a half, and so on to fill out the other entries of the matrix, taking the absolute value of the determinant, it's a half. And this is precisely the factor we need. And we notice that, in fact, we calculated it two different ways and it came out to the same value of a half. This will always be the case if you've done the calculation correctly. And it's just worth keeping in mind that you have a choice about which is the most convenient way to find the determinant factor you need. Now let's put this all together and calculate the integral. Putting everything together, the integral that we want to do is now a half, that's our Jacobian factor, which we leave outside since it's constant, uh, times an integral of the v variable and an integral over the u variable of our integrand, e to the u over v. We're doing the u integral, integral first. Here in square brackets is the answer. We need to evaluate it between the limits. And when we do that, we see that the exponential factor just turns into this e to the 1 minus e to the negative 1. The v remains inside the integral. We do the second integral. We put together the two factors. And here's our final answer. So Jacobians have made it straightforward. And that's the end of the example.